Hello, everyone, and welcome to Feeding the Soul, Grief, Loss, and Healing in the Pandemic, a webinar presented in partnership with Reimagine, a wonderful organization that inspires individuals, families, and communities to transform our experience around illness, dying, death, grieving, and living. It's also presented in support of Mental Health Action Day, an initiative bringing together over a thousand media brands, local and national nonprofit organizations, technology companies, influencers, and more from 32 countries to shift from mental health awareness to mental health action. You can learn more at mentalhealthishealth.us. My name is Debbie Holloway, community coordinator here at the James Beard Foundation, and I'm so happy to be welcoming you all this afternoon. Since March of 2020, the James Beard Foundation has been hosting virtual events and industry support webinars like this one to help navigate the challenges of COVID-19 and provide resources for the hospitality industry and better stay connected through difficult times. Before I introduce our moderator and panelists, here is some very quick housekeeping for everyone. This webinar is being recorded. We'll post a link to the recording on openforgood.com after the program wraps. If you have questions for the panelists, please write them in using the webinar toolbar. We'll try to address a few questions as time allows. And if you're having technical difficulties, just message us using the webinar toolbar and we'll do what we can to troubleshoot. I will be keeping an eye out and we'll be happy to assist. Today's moderator is Andrew Engel. Andy is senior programmer at Reimagine, where he recently produced the series Last Suppers with Kirsten Johnson and guests. His writing has appeared in Gastronomica and other publications, and he holds an MA in performance studies from New York University. And now to introduce our panelists. Emmanuel Brown is the executive director and steward of Acorn Center for Restoration and Freedom, located in occupied Muscogee Creek territory in Georgia. As an embodied freedom practitioner, Emmanuel works with BIPOC, queer, and trans folks creating new strategies for liberation and freedom using healing arts and spiritual justice. Since acquiring property in 2019, Emmanuel has been deepening his relationship with the land, creating a community medicinal and chef's farm and offering plant medicine to the community. He was senior fellow for Pop Culture Collaborative, received the 2021 Southern Healing Star Award, and was recently featured in the New York Times article, Four Studies of Black Healing Space. Next, we have Sharon Kaiulani Odom. Kaiu is a nutritionist and the program director of the Roots Cafe, Kokua Kalihi Valley, a nonprofit community health center in Hawaii. Roots Cafe serves traditional Hawaiian and Pacific Islander food. At Kokua Kalihi Valley, they work toward healing, reconciliation, and the alleviation of suffering through strong relationships that honor culture and foster health and harmony. Next, we have Brittany Doyle, who is the founder of Wise Health San Francisco, a public health consulting company that develops tailored community engagement strategies designed to reach underserved communities throughout the Bay Area in California. Ms. Doyle's efforts focus on advancing strategies related to increasing health equity, HIV prevention, and overcoming social isolation. Wise Health provides services within housing sites, homeless shelters, community centers, churches, and wherever there is a need for health impact. In March of 2021, Ms. Doyle was honored by the mayor of San Francisco for the work done through Wise Health. She also received the Community Innovator 2021 from the Powerful Women of the Bay and the Entrepreneur 2021 Award from 100 Black Women San Francisco chapter. She earned her master's of public health degree with a concentration in health education and communication from St. Louis University and an undergrad degree in consumer science and education from the University of Memphis. And finally, we have Wilfred Leviosa. He's been a community leader and advocate for the last 30 years and is currently the CEO of Waves Ahead, a nonprofit organization in Puerto Rico focusing on the elder and LGBTQ plus community managing two community centers focused on LGBTQ older adults. Wilfred has been working in the public health field for more than 25 years with marginalized communities such as the Latino and LGBTQ communities and HIV AIDS focused organizations in the United States and Puerto Rico as a mentor, mental health provider, evaluator, consultant, and supervisor. 
Born and raised in Puerto Rico, he graduated with a doctorate degree from Simmons University School of Social Work and a master's degree from Northeastern University's Department of Counseling Psychology, a graduate certificate from Suffolk University's Management of Nonprofits and a bachelor's degree from Boston University. So I think that's about as much introduction as we need. Uh, Andy, can I hand it over to you? You may, Debbie. It's been a pleasure working with you and James Beard Foundation. Again, my name is Andy Ingall. I'm a senior programmer at Reimagine End of Life. And it's such an honor to be in the presence with all of these speakers. And I'm loving getting to know all of you. Uh, I am calling in from Lenape Hoking, which is the native land uh, otherwise known as New York City in upstate, uh, in, in uh, uptown Manhattan. Uh, I'll start with some context. What is grief? It's a complex set of emotions and feelings that we associate with death and loss. And there are many theories out there. Most popular is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Five Stages, Denial, Anger, Bargaining, Depression, and Acceptance. And this five-stage theory has often been misunderstood. When you hear stages, you may think about a particular order of going from start to finish. But as so many of us know, grief is more of a process than going from point A to point B. It flares up at unexpected times, kind of like gas. And I think food is a critical tool to digest the complexity of emotions and feelings that come with grief. Those obvious feelings are sorrow, numbness, guilt, shock. But maybe less obvious is sometimes you get a sense of relief or a sense of purpose. And while we grieve, we often remember the good times and maybe even will let up a laugh. And with grief, there can be changes in appetite. And food can be mutually beneficial both to those in mourning and to those who care for them. It's instinctual to offer someone food when they're sick, both physically and mentally ill. And during the pandemic, folks left food for us in Tupperware containers. Organizations and restaurants delivered care packages. But here's what was missing. We weren't able to cook and eat together, to perform those important rituals of grieving, making the food together in the kitchen, setting the table, plating and serving, offering toasts, setting intentions, reciting grace. Um, and now um, many of today's listeners will be members of the food industry, your chefs, your restaurant owners, and while food is an, an as, is an aspect of each of your work, uh, none of these folks on our panel uh, work in a restaurant setting. Uh, and and they, well, they, they're not traditional chefs in a restaurant setting, I would say. And to help us start getting to know all of you better, um, maybe I'm gonna ask each of you to describe briefly your relationship to food and hospitality, either personally, or in your professional capacity. And I think I'm gonna start with Brittany Doyle, because I met Brittany first back in San Francisco when Reimagine was doing in-person festivals that spark conversations around end of life. Brittany and I met in a wine bar in Bayview, a historic African-American neighborhood in San Francisco. And uh, she hosted this amazing gathering of folks to share their grief stories, all about remembrance. And we did it over wine. So Brittany, tell me about your relationship to food. Okay, well, yes, um, that was a very memorable experience. I'll never forget that. Um, but with me, you know, I do a lot of community health programs. And so everything that I do, every time I go out to the community, everything is rooted in food. Number one, food is the best outreach to get people to come out and, you know, attend events. Um, since I have access to so many people, I always want to make sure that I'm providing some sort of healthy food item, introducing them to something new, letting them taste something. Um, and also, when we are like doing some sort of celebration, that's when I bring out the fatty foods. If we're celebrating someone's life, if somebody has transitioned, um, you know, for celebrating a birthday or, you know, something high tier special. You know, that's when we bring out, you know, the more fattier, sugary, carb foods, because that's what we know helps to make people feel good. But all in all, you know, everything that I do is rooted in food. I feel like that is the best way to reach community, um, to draw people in. 
and to get people feeling good. Thank you, Brittany. Ka'iulani from beautiful Hawaii. <laughs> Aloha, good morning. Aloha. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Yes, I am, am a uh, dietitian by trade, so that is where what I went to school for. And in school, you're taught that food is protein and carbohydrates and fats and, and vitamins and minerals. But from an Indigenous standpoint, what I know is that food connects us to who we are. It connects us to our culture, our spirit, our ancestors, our stories, our environment, all of these things that are very important to our health. And so for me, I use food in order to create health and wealth amongst the community. In Hawaiian, the word for water is vai, and the word for rich or wealthy or having a lot is vai vai. So we understood that our connection to the earth and to the elements, and our word for land is aina, I is to eat, and na is a pluralizer. So land is what, that is what feeds us. And so I try and use both my, um, Western trained knowledge of food, but my spiritual and cultural connections to food to work into the community to uplift the community through healthy connections. Beautiful. And from Puerto Rico, Wilfred, tell me about your relationship to food. Thank you, Andy. Um, we believe here in Waves Ahead um, and Sage Puerto Rico that there is an importance of camaraderie and rebuilding our resiliency and continue supporting our resiliency with the usage of food. Um, we have gone through a lot of devastation since 2017, hurricanes, earthquakes, and man-made um, political unrest issues that have made us develop a program that focuses on the food. We not only give you a box of food to help you through your tough times, but also we give you a box with seeds and um, planting materials so that you can develop your own garden in any area of your home. And that box is attached to mental health services because we believe in the strong power of talking about mental health, not taking, taking the taboo out of mental health and really talking about our issues using mindfulness and mental health and just conversation over a nice meal or over a nice drink. And um, we able to address the mental health issues that are impacting Puerto Rico. Thank you, Wilfred. And finally, Emmanuel from Georgia. Um, thank you so much, Andy, and for all of the panelists here. Um, you know, for me and in my community and culture, food was life. Like it was the thing that um, gathered people on a Friday night um, to, you know, talk about the, the woes of the week. Um, and so when I opened up Acorn Center for Restoration and Freedom to honor all of the, the food practitioners in my life, I knew that food was going to be central here. Um, and so for us here at the Retreat Center, food has meant a way of care. Um, it, uh, we hosted 10 retreats during the pandemic, which we were so surprised about. Um, but people came and a part of um, what what made it so special was the home cooked meal that they received um, in absence of being able to share a meal together, just being able to have a meal that they know was lovingly prepared for them um, really created an opportunity for real rest, restoration and wellness to be had here. And then we, you know, in my in my practice of, of food sharing here, you know, I live on eight acres of land, so it became clear that I also needed to start to grow food. Um, and so really focusing ourselves on growing a medicinal and chef's garden um, was really the opportunity for us to say, like, what are those herbs that we need in our diet and in our lives that will actually help us process the grief that we're experiencing, especially in a time like this where we don't know um, when the next thing is going to happen. <laughs> um, and so how do we just invite those herbs, invite those plants, invite that medicine into our lives on a daily basis through infusing it in the food that we eat so that our body gets in the habit of processing the grief, not holding on to it. Thank you, Emmanuel. You know, your, your vision for what you're doing at Acorn is just amazing and your relationship to land. And I love the fact that you were a Queens, you were a Queens kid and you know, this is sort of a new, thing for you and that's really cool 
Um, let's go back to the issue of land and the healing power of land. I want to hear from Wilfred and Kehilani too about respect for land, the sacredness of growing, preparing, serving, eating food, the importance of ritual. Maybe the two of you can riff on that a little bit. Sure, Wilfred, did you want to start? Do you want me to go? Oh. You start. <laughs> Okay, sure. Um, our connection to land here in Hawaii is really important. And a lot of times when, you know, as Indigenous people, and I, this is true all over the world, the, our land has been taken over. And so the access to land, so our access to, to grow our own foods, to go just down to the ocean to fish, you know, the ocean was our refrigerator, and now it's more of a a recreation ground for tourists that come here. And so what we noticed in the pandemic was that within just a two months of not having people on the land, in the ocean, that it was regenerating itself at just speeds that we hadn't even thought about. There's a beach close to where I live and I, I take a walk on there and the seaweed or the limu, we call it limu and we use it in our, um, diets all the time as a source of vitamins and minerals. Um, it just, there were blooms of it in ways that I haven't seen in over 20 years. There were fish that were coming back in just huge um, schools and balls of fish that we hadn't seen in a lot. So the, the land can regenerate itself and it can feed us, but we have to take care of it. We have to be really aware of it. The other thing is that when we're, we're planting and growing food, we can't just be thinking about the immediate future, that we need to be thinking about generations and generations to come. And so while we're growing our food, how do we make sure that this land continues to live and to thrive? And a lot of bigger corporations and other corporations that come into Hawaii, they don't think about that. They just want to, their, their main goal is profit. And so they take the lands, the prime growing lands, they only want profit. They're not from Hawaii. They don't have the same connection to the land that the indigenous people do over here. And the other thing that people don't know about Hawaii is we have the highest percentage of GMO lands, uh, people growing GMO because Hawaii is in the middle of the sea and it's not, you can grow stuff and even if it flies in the wind, it's not gonna, um, affect other states. It's going to affect our states. Um, but And also we have a year-long growing season. And the third reason is because we were really late in the game to recognize what was going on. And a lot of the GMO companies were entrenched in our communities that needed jobs. And so then you have our local people fighting against each other for those that want the, the life of the land to be the healthiest and others that need to feed their family. And it's a really tricky situation to have to resolve. We're still going through it here. But our, our religion and our culture and our spiritual relation to food was really, um, has a lot to do with the land and how we care for it and how it cares for us. The taro plant is seen as our older brother and our, our um, stories that are passed down remind us that as long as we take care of land, the land will take care of us. Wilfred, you know, you're on another territory, you know, uh, another uh, place, colonized. So maybe you have, to have some thoughts about this as well. Sure. Um, during the pandemic, it has been important for us to regain the access to our own land and it provided us time to learn about the things that we take for granted. Um, and here in, in Ways Ahead, we really saw the opportunity to really expand on our already known knowledge of the land and really be able to reinvest in our land. As Sharon mentioned, um, during that time of the pandemic, um, a lot of things started to nurture again by themselves um, because humans were all in clustered in our homes. And so we saw an opportunity to be able to teach our participants how to use the dirt to incorporate it into mindfulness techniques in order to be able to heal and to really be able to lower their anxiety. So we provided through phone and through these type of internet connectivity opportunities, um, techniques that they could implement in their own home gardening to be able to start respecting again the land and to really start owning back their land. They might have had a small garden in their homes and they take it for granted. They go in and out every day for appointments, for work, and they never even paid attention to it. But this time we had to 
pay attention to it. So we provided them the skills necessary to not only grow their vegetables, their herbs, um, but also to be able to use that to heal. We have had a lot of losses in our lives here in Puerto Rico for the last years. And it was important for us to give them these techniques that they could use on their own to really heal, to really be able to use that power from the earth that power from the mind and unite those two things. Um, we are very spiritual beings in general. And in Puerto Rico, we feel like we are also very spiritual. There are a lot of people who are very religious, um, conservative, but let's take those away and let's keep those people who are spiritual in their well being. And really, we worked with those beliefs, personal beliefs from many of the religions and spiritual backgrounds that we have in the island of Puerto Rico and be able to use them to work through their resiliency, to work through their healing process. Um, and it's an ongoing process. It's not a linear process, like you said, Andy, at the beginning. Um, it is a process and we can go back through all of those stages of grief one day after another, and we will always be able to work towards acceptance of that issue. And so earth, dirt, and the growth of our land is very important in that process. And we believe that. And we continue. And although we're coming out of this pandemic little by little, um, I know that this is a learning process that we will take forever um, and that we will need to continue um, reminding people of this time later on in the years to come. You know, what I'm hearing is there is loss of land, there's loss of traditional food ways, there's mm -hmm. loss of indigenous food products, uh, and there's, there's loss of place. And I'm gonna go back to Brittany now because I'm thinking again about my experience in Bayview, and I'm thinking about gentrification in cities as another kind of loss, and the threats that black communities face in cities like yours. Maybe you could riff on that for a little bit. Sorry, I was muted. Um, okay, so when we talk about, you know, the impact of communities, um, we think about how in a lot of the African American communities, it's always been um, food deserts. Um, people have not really had access to quality food. You know, there's a limited number of um, grocery stores um, but over the past years as the community has started to evolve and i mean i you know you talk about the impacts of gentrification um you know more grocery stores have come to the community but they've been like higher end grocery stores we've had asian markets we've had like these different type of like boutique markets that have popped up throughout the community but they haven't been able to survive because number one, they don't um, they don't meet the price points of the community. Um, you know, they don't accept like you know WIC or um, you know food stamps or things like that. So it's not easy to access for people in the community. Um, you also think about the theft that happens in these type of stores because people still need access to food, you know, by any ways possible. So you know they're losing a lot of profit and you know and goods and so stores have not been able to sustain in the communities that I serve and so that's why it's important that we still you know make sure that there's ways that we can provide access and we do this through you know food distribution programs um, you know meal programs hot food delivery programs you know there's always um, these different types of engagements that still happen in community to meet the needs of you know having access to quality healthy sometimes healthy not all the time healthy but it's still meeting you know meeting the needs of the community but you know this is a wave that i've been seeing um due to the impact of gentrification is that you know the stores do come in they're not able to sustain and there's still like this you know um need that needs to be fulfilled for you know access to quality food Brittany, when we were speaking earlier you know i mentioned hard conversations. And that's what, you know, Reimagine is about, is having those difficult conversations about end of life and mortality. And when we spoke about this, you mentioned something that I thought was really interesting about in planning for the food distribution, some of your volunteers had different ideas about what kind of food should be distributed. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, okay, so <laughs> that's interesting. Um, 
Yeah, so when, we, when we're meeting the needs of the community, you know, we always want to make sure that the food that we distribute out is culturally relevant, you know, that it's something that people want to eat. Um, so a lot of times you have people that want to distribute food that, you know, meets the needs of the soul. So we're talking about like soul food, fried catfish, you know, more of the fattier in, you know, the more fattier end of the cultural spectrum. <laughs> But then, you know, on the other end, there are also foods that I feel is important to distribute. So you want to make sure that it's quality, make sure that it's organic. Um, you want to make sure that um, it doesn't expire, that it has a healthy shelf life, you know, things that are sustainable in the household. Um, but most of all, we want to make sure that our communities have access to higher end quality organic foods. Um, there's also, you know, there's a lot of food distribution programs that will distribute out foods that, you know, are maybe close to expiration, you know, they're, the shelf life is about to expire, you know, it's a little bit older, but they still need to get it out, it might not be that perfect, I think it might be imperfect food, I, actually I think that may be an actual program, no shade to them, because Food access is very important, but you know sometimes food is distributed out that is not as quality. And I just feel like if we're going to serve our community, we want to make sure that we're serving, giving the best. If we're going to give, our communities deserve the best. And so that's why I feel it's really important that whatever we distribute out is quality, organic. Um, even comes with like a recipe on how to make it. If it's something they've never seen before, here try something new. You know, we always want to make sure we're elevating our communities and teaching them something new. And we can easily do that, you know, do that through food. And I just always advocate that, you know, when you do community programs to partner with people that think the same way as you and want to make sure that whatever they send out to the community is very quality as, as well. It's important. Indeed. Emmanuel, now I'm going to ask you a question about those hard conversations. In your experience, hosting these retreats over the past year. Do you think food has provided energy or inspiration for hard conversation topics like, what will my life look like without a loved one? Um, what are my values in living fully and freely? What are my wishes when I get older and my life is sunsetting? Um, curious on your thoughts. Yeah, you know, I think it's so interesting to talk about um, what are the things that allow us to have the capacity to be in those more hard conversations. Um, the, the large bulk of the community that ACORN serves are queer and trans folks, 100% hands down. And so many of us um, come into adulthood often seeking family. Um, and I think the pandemic really resurfaced that either desire or need for family or the families that we were birthed into to be pushed a little bit. You know, many queer and trans people, um, especially younger queer and trans people ended up back in their family homes. Um, and maybe they had been out for two or three years to, to understand and know themselves. And so I think the opportunity at ACORN is that, um, is that uh, when, when people come here, they get to experience what's possible when care is at the center. When they come here, they get to experience what's possible when healing isn't about something, correcting something that is wrong with you, but returning to wholeness. Um, when people come here, they get to experience building their own internal capacity to go forth and do those hard conversations. Um, so I had several people, you know, um, who were here were like, you know, after I was done with my four or five days, I could talk to my siblings um, about what I needed from them because now I'm living at one of their homes because job insecurity set in or because I just was in a space where it wasn't going to work for me to stay through an entire pandemic, right? Um, and then I think as a practice community, because we're not all queer and trans people when we do our virtual events um, and things of that nature, it does really uh, cultivate a, an ability for people to be in those hard conversations with a compassion leaning forward, right? There's something about 
even sharing a virtual meal together. So we've we've done those types of things where it's like, listen, you have your dinner wherever you are and we're gonna come and maybe we're gonna hold a conversation that really creates that connection um, that people really need to feel for them to take the risk to go and have harder conversations. Um, and I would say, I would use one example for, for me in my own literal life um, is with my own siblings. Um, I have two older sisters um, and we really took the time to be with each other um, as much as we could. And I felt even more fortified after being on the land for a year, um, serving people food with care and doing some of those types of things that remind me of home um, to be able to say to them, you know, as a trans masculine person, like, hey, you know, what are the things that I need you all to understand about like who I am, who my community is, so that you can participate here more, right? So that you can actually come to what we're doing here on the land. So I think as food is crucial to that, especially when it's something that is so rooted inside of care. Thank you, Emmanuel. That's beautiful. Okay, Ulani, I'm curious if these types of hard conversations happen at roots. Well, they happen all the time. We are in a community, first of all, that is seen as a, um, you know, when people come to Hawaii, so we have a really large community of Micronesian, Samoan, Pacific Islanders, you know, Filipino, Japanese, but uh, the, when we're looking at the social determinants of health and how they affect food, our community, our clinic sits between the first and third largest public housing. Uh, structures. And so one of the things that we have had some hard conversations about even are the distribution of food within a pandemic. How do you make sure that you are um, giving your community agency, you're treating them with dignity and respect while you're providing these feeding programs? And a lot of our conversations have been around you know, something that was, we heard in the very beginning, and it was, you know, not my story, but someone else's story, but it was really, you know, someone who meant well and to distribute food, but the other, you know, person replying that there really is no dignity in your children picking out what my children are going to eat. And so we took that to heart and we realized that, you know, sometimes it's just not possible, but what we understood was that it was the connections that were being made while all of this was, you know, the who was uh, providing the food, someone else called calling all the time to make sure when nobody else was calling them. We just heard a story the other day of someone in our community that was telling the person that was um, calling them, you know, please turn on your camera because I know this isn't, we're not going to be able to talk um, keep this going, but I want us to see each other's faces. So now when we see each other in community, we know that we're family. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a community that was discriminated against very early on. Um, we, I remember coming by one of the housing projects and seeing a reporter and her cute little red dress and red shoes, and they were focusing in on the housing project to say that this community in here was having COVID cases. And I thought, you know, they would never do it in any of our other communities that were, you know, seen like Kahala or, you know, Kailua or, or these other communities that are more affluent. And I thought, you know, that is just discrimination. And then, then um, when it was found out that we were ha having a rise in cases, they were ticketing people in our community. I have a um, someone on our team that is college educated, but she comes from Micronesia. And the police stopped her when she was walking around without a mask. And then it was only after she started talking that he realized that it wasn't his perception of who it was. And so these um, conversations just within the time of COVID about discrimination, about social justice, about equity in our community are conversations that we have to have every day because they're affecting our community on a daily basis. Thank you. Wilfred, can you tell me about the particular experience of food delivery and food resiliency with LGBTQ plus elders on the island and what special um, sensitivity, sensitivities might be required uh, when you're having conversations about aging or planning for end of life? 
You know, it is a complex question um, and it's a complex issue that we need to address. Um, many people here in Puerto Rico forget that we are intersectionalities, that we live every day. They only see us as LGBT or they only see us as an elder or they only see us that we live in the suburban or urban areas. And we are all of that. Um, even though my home may be in San Juan, my ancestors came from the Midland or from the middle of the island here in Puerto Rico. And so I come from that point of conversation. I bring all of me in the conversations. And when you deliver a box, many of my staff sometimes just delivered it because they had so many to deliver on that day. And I started to stop them and say, no, it's not about the amount of boxes you deliver on X day. It is about those conversations that you must have with that individual. And if that individual, most probably you are the only contact that that person had for that day, for that week, for that month, possibly um, during this pandemic time. So I say we need to invest in our future by pointing in that moment of time and just centering with that individual. Um, trauma is a very complex issue. And when we start ta talking about grief, we forget that there is so much ancestral trauma that we bring into the conversation. We forget about that vicarious trauma that we bring into that conversation and that we must listen to that other individual because we are bringing our own issues in that conversation. Some of these individuals, um, as I mentioned, are the only contact that we have with our staff. And some of our staff are not mental health care providers. They're just also volunteers themselves that are also receiving a box when given a box. And so it is not the, the, situ the box is just a tool to open up that conversation um, of very complex issues. Um, grief, dying and end of life, as well as that word that many people don't like to talk, trauma and mental health are things that we need to address on every day. We must um, bring to our conversations every day and we must be mindful of that moment. Um, many times as providers, we have so much to do on one day, but it is time that we take time and maybe COVID, this is something that has taught us that time we have it on a daily basis. And so it is important to keep um, focusing on that intervention and focusing on that conversation. Um, you know, I remember growing up with my great grandmother who used to sit me down and start talking to me about those histories. And at that moment, as a small child, I used to say, oh my God, when is this going to end? But now I'm yearning for those times again. And a lot of people are yearning for those times because we have had so much time in personal time by ourselves that we are encountering that human touch, that human heat, that nature that we have of a human nature. So, Wilfred, you, you talked about ancestral trauma and then you talked about ancestral joy with your grandmother. And mm -hmm. I'm curious about how we remember and honor our loved ones. And this is a question for all of you. Um, this idea of handing down recipes, preserving land. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on food and land as legacy, inheritance. You know, it, we started a program here a few years ago that is called Heroes and Heroines of our community. Um, our members of our LGBT older adult community that have made a mark, maybe not in the whole country, but maybe in their community. And we honor them and we connect by, well, during COVID, during these times in these platforms, but before COVID in person um, and allow them to tell their stories. We don't have any questions. We just have a conversation and then let them experience that and share them at the table. Um, before the pandemic, is, it was, it's a project called Sage Table that we unite over a meal and talk about our experiences um, in multi-generational, intergenerational conversations. Now during pandemic, we just call them interactions in, um, and we talk about our stories. And it is so important to honor their lives as well as to hear them and listen to them. It is so important for us to be able to put them in that spot and give them and honor them in that spot. Um, and so, I mean, 
spot in a very um, joyful way, not in a negative connotation. Um, and we also hear about their traumas because we can learn so much from it and we can also enjoy from them. Um, it is a word that has a negative connotation socially, but we can turn it around. And as you say, Andy, ancestral joy, we can turn them into joy and we can learn so much from it. Um, so we just honor them as heroes and heroines, but really they're just every hero without a cape, you know that phrase? Um, and we honor them, we really do. And every age is a useful age to have and to honor. Thank you. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna add, um, before my grandmother passed away, she felt like it was important to make a cookbook for all of her recipes. And I actually have it right here. And so she made a cookbook and it has like all of our favorite recipes of hers in here and like recipes of um, like her family members that was her favorites and like people in the churches. And this was like a legacy that, you know, that she left for us because um, it has her famous spaghetti recipe in here. So I always hold it so dear, but um, I thought that, you know, this was like really important and really special. Um, but, you know, whenever we think about like legacy, you know, I just once again, just think about, you know, food, how everything just happens over food. Whenever we, you know, come together and remember people to talk about people when people pass away, um, you know, in African-American culture, we have like a repass where once again, everybody comes together to remember the person that um, we lost. And it's always over like really, ribs, macaroni and cheese, you know, caramel <laughs> cake. I just came back from a funeral two days ago in St. Louis. And so we had like a whole spread, green beans made in butter, <laughs> um, mashed potatoes with cheese on top, you know, all different types of cakes and stuff like that. Um, you know, and I think of like how that's a tradition that, you know, I think goes through every African-American family you know, I can't speak on other religions. I mean, not, I mean, other cultures, I'm sorry, but I know in the African-American culture, that is like um, a traditional, um, you know, cultural event that happens, you know, when somebody passes away. Brittany, are some of those foods like, or those dishes that may be in your grandmother's recipe book, were those served at her repast? Yes, they were actually, some of them were. Um, like the ribs. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's typically like the same type of food. Her fried chicken, yes, was at the repast and her fried chicken is in here too. Um, and then actually, if I go through here, I don't think anything in this cookbook is healthy. Not one thing <laughs> is healthy in this cookbook. Um, but yeah, um, and typically it's the same types of foods that are served at all repasses. But um, that's just, you know, a way that we just come together and just remember, you know, it's just something about soul food that, you know, just makes us feel good whenever we, when our families come together, um, it's always just used as a way to engage, you know, to have conversation as Wilfred was saying before, just how it, um, you know, it allows you to get into the door to talk to somebody. As long as you have food and you're bringing food, you know, you can always get into the door and get a, a conversation you know, going, it's just, just something about, you know, making it, making you feel good. Okay, Iwilani, I'm reminded now of our previous conversation where you mentioned the divine significance of different foods. And that really resonated with me. And I'm curious, particularly eating those foods, maybe at a funeral feast and what that experience would be like. Maybe you could tell us more about that. Sure. Um, you know, this is actually one of our hard conversations that we sometimes have because passing our, our food is all spiritually connected. And so in the Hawaiian religion, we had 40,000 plus gods. And so when the first colonizers came and they brought in their, their religion, it was just one more God. And we were like, yeah, bring them, add them to the bunch because our gods were all elemental in nature. They, they represented all the elements. And so you understood the nature and the world that you lived in through our religion. But what was important about it was every single one of our foods represented some type of spiritual entity. And so when you ate those foods, you got in all of those qualities that you admired. And in the 
the Western type of religion, you know, people will say that's pagan, but you think about it, you go to church, you eat the bread, you're eating the body of Christ, you drink the wine, you're drinking the blood of Christ. That becomes a very spiritual event, but it's done on a Sunday once a week in a, in a house someplace. And so, but for a lot of indigenous cultures, that spirituality is connected to the food on a daily basis. So that means when you're working with it in the ground, you're respecting it, you understand it, you honor it. When you are preparing it, you realize that um, the energy in, that you put into it will, will feed. Even when I work with um, young, we have a pregnancy class for Hawaiian couples. And when I work with them, I remind them that they hold the eggs for their children who hold the eggs for their grandchildren and their eggs for the great and so all the way down and so when you eat these cultural and spiritual foods you are not only feeding yourself but you are feeding all of your future generations and how do we create this cycle where we're eating these foods we're we're um, having the desire for them and so we celebrate you know on a one-year party we celebrate we have a thing um, called an emu which is an underground oven where the pig and the the kalo and other things can be put inside and we celebrate a lot of things where we come together and that's an important thing that we're losing nowadays to come together and to create and to tell these stories and to talk about the food nowadays people just cater a lot of events and so when you do that you lose the ability to come together and have the uncle that was good at this dish pass down the knowledge and the stories for that and, and the family coming together for three or four days to create this celebration. But when you are eating these foods and when you're you're preparing them and teaching the lessons, you're you're really creating a connection that goes back generations and that that lives in your body you're feeding your foods that created the microbiome of your ancestors you're feeding the foods that carry the stories of your spirit you're feeding the foods that connect you to your grandparents and your great grandparents and so this is what i try and teach when we're doing all of our our food events is that um we're connected through time and history by these foods and that we will continue to connect forward. So whether it's a funeral or a baby's first parent, it's the cultural significance and the spiritual uh, relevance and the um, really connecting to who you are that comes in through all of these foods. Nice, I think we are taking questions in uh, here, let's see. Yes, wonderful. Um, I want to go to this notion of food liberation. Mm. Uh, and historically, I'm thinking about the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program, uh, making sure that no one is hungry. And, uh, you know, during the pandemic, I noticed like just down my street, it was like maybe a month ago, yet another mutual aid refrigerator opened up on the street in New York City. Um, and this is a wonderful concept of being able to um, go there. If you've got some extra food, you just bring it to the refrigerator. If someone needs it, they come and take it. Uh, and I'm curious if all of you can think of other examples of food projects that liberate us from injustice. Um, I can start here. Um, I, Acorn happens to be very privileged to be a part of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, which is an alliance of, you know, over 100 different food and land justice projects covering um, across the United States. And what was so brilliant about that particular project that I saw really tying um, liberation and foodways and land and liberation together was in the way that they were resourced in 2020, like it became very clear to people, right? Sometimes, you know, and in, especially in a US context, the money talks, right? Like it's like when people are like giving millions of dollars to something, it lets us know like, okay, um, this is the thing that now people understand to be important, even though the people who've been doing that work have been doing it for generations. And so they were able to um, really move, um, you know, over $5 million, um, not just uh, within the Alliance itself, but even beyond the Alliance to folks who were doing um, food and land work. Um, and that to me was so huge to be able to say like, they really robustly um, resource the Black food spaces 
Um, and these were often spaces that were the only spaces that felt safe enough for people to gather during the pandemic, because you could be outside and work the farm in a socially distanced way with your mask on and things like that. Um, and then the other thing I would point to is like here for us at ACORN, um, the ways in which we held food and liberation and healing um, was what we provided over 200 care packages um, to folks across the United States, the Caribbean and Canada um, that always had some sort of herbal bundle in it um, to support people through the pandemic time. And for us, it was important not only that our that our, that our people felt connected to us and this particular landmass, but also felt connected to each other. Because then when we did some programming, we were able to show people how to make elderberry syrup um, from scratch and how to um, use these particular teas in their very um, everyday life. Um, and that felt really important for us in that way. And then the final thing I'll say about food and liberation is the ability to, you know, have this garden, our community garden here was unstoppable. We had people, everybody who came through usually left with a bundle of something. Um, and we had so many people who even were willing to like share their seeds with us that were now growing in this growing season. Um, and that felt like a way that um, a piece of mutual aid that I had not thought about that emerged out of 2020. Thank you. Other examples that come to mind, they may not even necessarily have to do with your own programs. Things yeah. that you have in the community. Um, I want to say, for me, what I see in the community when it comes to food liberation is like anytime, a, you know, a program or an effort or initiative comes out that uplifts and empowers the community to take control of receiving access of food. And so I see that when I um, see like the produce stands at the liquor stores, because now the business owners are motivated to increase access to the community by allowing, you know, different types of food to come in. I can't think of the name of the the market, it's a program, I think it's a national program where they put like these produce stands in the liquor stores. And when you see like co-ops, co-op grocery stores that are like community ran, community owned, pop up in, um, you know, underserved communities, um, meal distribution programs when it's, when it's like community ran, where the community is taking accountability and they're distributing out organic produce or, you know, healthy meals and increasing access that way. But anytime um, there's a program that takes place that, you know, is overcoming some sort of inequity, um, you know, empowering the local businesses, empowering the community to take control. I think that that's, you know, what food liberation really does, you know, looks like in the community. Wilfred and So for us, um, we have seen during the pandemic a grassroots mobilization of co-ops, of farmers, of coalition members of nonprofit organizations come together to be able to bring from the farm to us, to the communities um, and to the municipalities, the food that really for a while wasn't being collected because of all the parameters of public health that we need to follow so we all went to it we picked it up and as coalition we started to distribute around the land it was really a grassroots movement that um, it was all started by individuals farmers by individual members of co-ops that saw the need to feed our people the government left us behind the government didn't even pay attention to us while we were in our areas and in our homes um, so it was up to us, individual members of the community, to go and bring it to us. Um, and so I applaud this initiative. Um, it's called Mesa Social um, and the social co-op here in Puerto Rico that we were able to do that. And so I applaud them for their initiative that fed so many thousands and thousands of people during this pandemic. Can you any examples of mutual aid that come to mind? No, we did a, a lot. We we looked to our own community um, when we the pandemic came around and what we could do within our community. And we are probably the only federally qualified health center that has 100 acres of land attached to it up in the valley where we also do cultural healing, cultural growing of, of medicine and foods. And so when the pandemic hit, we immediately wanted to see what was in our community for resources and what kind of outside help came in it. 
I want to say that I'm really grateful for a lot of the private foundations because they allowed us to act immediately, whereas a lot of the government types of foundations were, there were a lot of hoops to jump to to try and get things to our community. But one of the things that we did was we took our cultural medicines, um, turmeric or olena, and we distribute it widely in the community and throughout the doctors. We started to order seeds and so that we could, everybody that um, had land could also be growing their own food. We you know, got together. There's also a program uh, by Aloha Harvest that is allowing uh, farmers that um, have extra to, to still be able to pay them money and that all comes into our community. But it was really the process of us that were kind of working in silos before within our island to start to know what everybody else is doing and how can you help each other? Because I think before the pandemic, everybody was kind of just doing their thing, but all of a sudden we I needed to know before I took uh, food from another farmer, what did their community need first? I needed them to make sure they took care of their community before then I bought the food, the extra food that they had. And and so the pandemic has allowed us to to move across some of these silos that we had to really think, to start the conversations about, we are an island state, we bring in 80% of our food, how do we work together as one? And I think there are different programs in our community that are supporting that, that are talking about our food system, but it's really about um, not just thinking about us as individuals, but thinking us as a, our whole state, as a community, and that we need to work together to figure out what's best for everybody mm -hmm. and not just for our own individual program. And so mm -hmm. there's a, I, I don't, there's not like one specific program because there's a lot of people involved in that, but I think that that's a really important component for us here in Hawaii. Thank you, Kayulani. Um, Debbie, do we have time maybe for one response to one question that's come in? That sounds good. That sounds good. Okay, so one of you should take this. This is from May. Thank you for this question, May. We think a lot about food being a stabilizer or a constant. Have your personal relationships with food changed over time or over experiences? Such a good question. Who's brave? I can at least start. Um, so I've been a round bodied um, person my entire life. Um, and I think that there was such a, a connection between um, looking at black folks and I come from a black diaspora Caribbean community um, and seeing us as like unhealthy eaters, right? <laughs> um, and us seeing ourselves that way, right? Like I think about, you know, the organic movement of the early 2000s, once it hit New York City, then that became a thing. You know, nobody was thinking about organic food in the 80s. Um, and so um, when that became a thing, it very much um, was set up to look at Black communities as like unhealthy eaters. Um, and that, you know, just changing to organic foods, even though they weren't making organic collard greens or they weren't making um, organic foods that we were going to eat or that were accessible in my neighborhood, that that was going to be the solution to our unhealthy eating process. Um, and what I found over time is that my relationship to food inside of like healthy, unhealthy really has really shifted to like, um, where do I feel movement and where do I feel stagnation, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I, you know, I, for the work that I do, for the healing work that I do in the world, I got to keep things moving through my body. Um, I can't feel stagnation. Um, and sometimes um, that has been the, the guiding post about what drives my food or eating habits is noticing my own body's response to any particular thing um, and not necessarily um, allowing myself to be trapped into like what is healthy and what is unhealthy. Um, and I think what the power of that is, is it allowed me to um, heal from some deep anti-Blackness that can even be heard in other Black people's mouths, right? Um, that was coming from an outside source, um, but that can actually be heard from other Black people. I was able to heal from that. And so now that really guides my food choices of like, oh, you know, I know what keeps my body moving and I know what gives me comfort. And I know that actually will shut my system down. And I try to use my food that way. How about for other folks? I'm curious. 
Yeah, I would have to agree with a lot that you were saying. Um, I think that um, from a standpoint of being a you know a woman and just how my body has changed and it is changing over the years before I used to just eat anything that I wanted to eat but now as my body is changing I know that you know there's certain foods I cannot tolerate there's certain nutrients that I know I'm going to need at different times and so I find myself um eating a lot to like heal, to sustain, um, to, you know, elevate my moods. I've been using foods in like all kinds of different ways now that I think is very, very important. And then I'm very, also very mindful of what I introduce in my body. Um, I think last year when I had a lot of time to sit with myself, um, I got to learn a lot more about my body because I was stuck in one place for a long time. So you know, I started to, you know, learn more about my relationship with food and how I could not let it take control of me, especially when I needed the comfort. Um, Cause you know, last year was very sad. So, you know, a lot of people, including myself, you know, comforted myself with food, but as time went on, you know, I've learned, you know, how to change that relationship and how to, you know, empower my body and, you know, heal and grow and move forward um, using food, you know, for the good and not necessarily you know, in a way, you know, in a bad way. Yeah, I think for me as a dietitian, it's letting go of judgment. And, um, you know, as a really young dietitian, spam is so prevalent here in Hawaii. And I'd be like, don't eat spam. It's not good for you. It's got nitrites and chemicals. And then I realized that, yeah, that wasn't going over so well. And so then I would be like, okay, let's make spam and cabbage and have some brown rice so you have fiber to get it through your body. And then, you know, maybe some orange slices and carrots so we have vitamin A and protective vitamins. And then we've moved to a place where we've just developed our own spam recipe and we try and use local pork and organic sugar and, you know, some uh, sea salt and we make our own. But one of my really defining moments came from a UH uh, professor in one of our decolonizing diet dinners that we used to have in our, our cafe before COVID. And she talked about growing up, there were seven kids in the family and each of their stockings, they got like Vienna sausage or spam or corned beef. And, and then for Christmas breakfast that morning, they all put together all their canned meats and they had, that's what they made for breakfast for everybody. And so that her story and her attachment to that spam had nothing to do with how it was made, but it was the memory that it brought back to her of eating Christmas breakfast with her family. And so it's just, um, you know, over time, just embracing all, trying not to label foods. Of course, you want people to eat healthy and we do our best our can, but really the cultural and, and stories and connections are what I really try to focus on when we're working with food. Wilfred, we just have a few minutes, but please sure. share with um, I think our Puerto Rican diet is very well known to be a very poor, unhealthy diet, but that has been the judgment, like Sharon said, of people judging us. Um, that colonizing mentality continues even in our food. And so we need to honor that. Um, and we need to honor that we cook a lot of roots and we have learned through this pandemic to balance and to enjoy life every day so even if you want to eat that root that is fried, um, eat it, enjoy it, um, because we all can all find a moment of joy. And it's all roots, um, alcapurrias, empanadillas. We have a lot of um, sausages um, that, are man -made, that are made at home. And so we just need to balance everything. And what I have learned through this pandemic is a balance and really be mindful of that and to enjoy the food of our ancestors because they all brought it to the mainland of Puerto Rico just that we can enjoy it and that we can learn about it. So I just, it's a balance. It's just a balance and a joyful balance. Speakers, I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna hand this back to Debbie. Here I come. Thank you everyone so much. This was such a such a lovely panel. Thank you so much to Andy for your excellent moderating. Thank you to Reimagine for helping uh, us to organize and produce it. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists, Brittany, Caillou, Emmanuel, and Wilfred. And thank you to each of you for tuning in.
um, it was an honor and a pleasure to, to be able to host this great conversation at this time. Uh, Andy just popped a great URL and a prompt in the chat. Uh, Wilfred will be working again with Reimagine at the Table Talk on June 1st, which is really soon. So you can find out more about that at letsreimagine.org. And you can uh, also check out many of the other incredible virtual events and projects that they have going on. If you want to check out more of the James Beard uh, produced virtual events, you can go to openforgood.com. And I hope everyone has a, a really wonderful and safe rest of your day. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Aloha. Aloha.